our first topic is going to be imposter syndrome. An article came out recently called Why Everyone's Why Everyone Feels Like They're Faking It. The concept of imposter syndrome has become ubiquitous. Critics and even the idea's originators question its value. This article, uh, imposter syndrome, was originally imposter phenomenon. And I believe it was about 50 years ago that the two uh, professors coined this term. And it kind of has taken a life of its own in the era of social media. And so this article does a, a revisit of the concept, the original concept, with the originators of the concept. And it does some additional exploration in, co- in current times with different perspectives that were not considered in the original research. And so that's what we're going to talk about it today. Marsha is going to talk about it from the therapy perspective. I'm going to speak on it from the small business perspective because I see a lot of either imposter syndrome or something that is mislabeled as imposter syndrome, particularly in the community of black women business owners. And that's what we're going to discuss today. So without further ado, we're going to get into it and I'm going to hand it off to Marsha. Thanks, Lindsay. What's up? Um, So this is the first show for Mind Your Business. And I really want to talk to you about just around the mental health around imposter syndrome, Black women, um, business owners, just women in general, really. I think that imposter syndrome, I see that coming into my private practice around wearing this mask that they speak about in this article um, about, I think that sometimes people don't even know they're wearing the mask and just teaching them how to take it off. What is their personality like and how they want to present to the world? So Lindsay, what I want to know is kind of what struck you in this, in this article? What probably the main thing is the, what was not covered from my perspective in working with small business owners. What I see in this article is, um, imposter syndrome within the context of corporate employment and particularly the difference in imposter syndrome for white women versus black women or the perspective on it. Uh, What I saw in the article is, you know, white women, uh, uh, their perspective, the original uh, originators of the research are two white women. So of course they they presented it from their perspective and which is a, a perspective of feelings of self inadequacy Right. Wondering if you've gotten gotten over on people or somehow put gotten into a position that you didn't earn and you're not worthy of it. Whereas the black women uh, in the article are saying that, well, that's really not our experience. We we have to work very hard, extremely hard to get everything we have and everywhere, every room we find ourselves in. We worked very hard to get there. Our problem is feeling Uh, being undervalued or underrated, not feeling like we're not good enough. It's, you know, we're, we're being oppressed. We're not oppressing ourselves. And I see that I get that. I I understand that that's a real thing, but the perspective that I see it from is the small business community. I see these women after they have decided that they're, they're done with corporate America. They're tired of the glass ceiling. I call it the black women's glass ceiling. I say it's about a a 15 year cycle. You get freshmen every year. There's a new crop of freshmen girls who go to college. And about 15 years later, they're the ones who are exiting corporate America because they've realized that that they were sold a lie. Getting the credentials and doing everything that they were supposed to do. They're still not being uh, allowed to advance because of race and gender. And so they leave and start businesses. Black women start more businesses than any other demographic. So by the time I encounter these women, they are highly skilled professionals. They've had to work extremely hard and be over-credentialed just to get into the room. And so by the time I see them, they've, they have incredible skills, abilities, and they're, they're highly skilled professionals. And they don't charge what they're worth. And this is something that I've seen over and over and over and over again with many different women across different industries, but it's the same story. They significantly undervalue their solutions that they provide. 
to the to the extent that I've seen more on more than one occasion uh, a black woman business owner. I looked at her pricing. I was like, yo, you need to add a zero to that. You're, you're charging about 10 percent of what you're delivering is worth. And the challenge that I faced is that I got a lot of pushback. I've gotten vigorous pushback on that and it's consistent. The notion that they're worth more and can charge more is not received well at all. And it was after experiencing this over and over and over again with different women that I realized that this was not something that I was going to be able to help them with. This was not a coaching issue. I could show them what to do and how to do it to get more money, significantly more money, to accomplish the things that they said they wanted to accomplish, and they won't do it. They will resist. Um, in, in many instances, it, it became a thing of self-sabotage where we, we start in the beginning with, let's set your objectives. What are you trying to accomplish? I want this, this, and this. Let's assign a revenue target to that. Okay, yeah, I want this much money. Okay, so here's the plan for doing it. We're going to start here. We're going to put this in place. We're going to restructure your pricing. We're going to start doing it. And so it's a systematic process. Well, I work with uh, uh, service-based business owners, people who sell their knowledge, their expertise. When you have knowledge, when you when your product is your knowledge, the process for monetizing it is is the same process for everybody. It's we're going to uh, productize that knowledge, turn it into a digital product, put it in some form, and we're going to use the internet to sell that to as many people as possible. That's how you can scale that business. Uh, it's a low-cost business to scale because you don't have to manufacture anything. You already paid for the knowledge you have. And so it's a very systematic process I have for helping people uh, achieve, uh, significantly increase their revenue. And what I would see is these women would be fine with the program once it was, but then once it started working, they could start to see that it was actually working. They, they slam on the brakes, self-sabotage. They would start, they would do anything except take the next step forward. When, once they could see that the program was actually working and I would, I would ask, it was, it, it became frustrating when you, you have a process that is working and the person derails the process because they see that it is working and moving them towards what they wanted and seeing that over and over and over again with different people was what, what led me to conclude that this was not a coaching issue. It was not a, the coaching was not going to be the solution to this. There needed to be some type of, some type of therapy, something that I was not qualified to, to provide. And so that's when I, uh, came to realize that, okay, there's some issues here that, that a, a professional therapist needs to address. And this is a really widespread problem because it is the exact same thing I keep seeing over and over and over again with different people.